Welcome to Gospel Truth, celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us. And now, here's Gospel Truth Bible teacher, Andrew Womack. Happy New Year's Eve to you. Praise God, this year went by quickly. Uh, I tell you, one of the reasons I started ministering on how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will is because being at the end of the year, you know, people kind of do an evaluation. What happened this year? Where am I going? What's next year going to be like? I think it's a good time to do inventory. We probably ought to do it more than once a year. We ought to constantly be uh, evaluating. Am I making my life count? Am I pursuing the things of God or am I letting the cares of this life and other things choke the Word of God? So that's the reason I started ministering on how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will. Now our offices are closed today. Our helpline is closed so that you won't be able to call, but our website is of course up and I would encourage you to get this book on how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will. And then we have these study guides where each one of them is on how to find, then how to follow, and then how to fulfill God's will. These are designed specifically so that you can disciple other people. We've got a lot of material, an entire package deal, and I'd encourage you to take advantage of it. I've been sharing for the first three days of this week just talking about how that God has a specific, a general, and then a specific will for every single person. It's not up to us to just pick and choose that before we were even formed in our mother's womb, God had already got a plan for our life. Nobody has taken God by surprise. God knows every one of you and He has a very specific purpose for each one of you. Boy, that's important. I don't think that the average person believes that, but that's what the Bible teaches. I've already used a lot of scriptures on that. And then I talked about how that the key for me in finding God's will for my life was Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. God spoke these verses to me in, at Christmas time, 1967. And Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Man, that last phrase there, it says, you will prove, make manifest of the physical senses, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. When I saw that, it was just like a big old huge arrow from God pointing right here. This is your answer. And so from Christmas of 1967 until I had my miraculous encounter with the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968, I just prayed about this, asked God to help me be a living sacrifice, explain to me what that meant. What does it mean to not be conformed to this world? What does it mean to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? And I just focused on this, and then I had this miraculous encounter with the Lord. And so let me make a couple of points here. One of them is that, you know, with me, and I think that this would be true of many people that are watching this program, it may not be just an instantaneous thing where you hear my program today, you pray, and boom, you become a living sacrifice. With me, it was a process. And actually, I've, I've described, you know, from Christmas of 67 until March the 23rd, 68, that's four months, but it actually was longer than that because a year and a half before God gave me Romans 12, 1 and 2, I was seeking God's will, wanting to know God's will for my life. So if you add all of this together, it was about nearly a two-year process for me of making my heart receptive to where God could reveal Himself to me and these things could come to pass. Now, I'm not sure it has to be that long for everybody, but I do believe that with many people, it is a process. Most of us are, you know, it's like uh, the Bible talks about having a hardened heart. And you can become so hardened that it just takes a while to soften us, our hearts up, to penetrate and to get us to a place to where we can make this commitment. You know, I've likened it to a sponge before. If you take an old sponge, a real sponge, and if you dip it in water like that, it may get a little bit of moisture around the outside, but it'll still be hard inside 
because it has, you have to put it under there and it has to marinate. It has to soak and absorb that. And it just takes a while for this to happen. Likewise, it takes a while for our heart to really become soft and pliable enough to the Lord. You know, let me share this scripture with you out of Jeremiah chapter 29. And in verse 11, most people know what verse 11 says. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I think it's the NIV that says to give you a hope and a future. Either one of those are great, but I like this expected end because instead of me serving God and then wondering about what's my latter days going to be like, uh, am I going to go out with a whimper? Am I going to, you know, have Alzheimer's? Am I going to do this or that? No, you serve God. There is an expected end. There is a promised end that according to your days, so shall your strength be. So anyway, that ministers to me. I like this where it says that to give you an expected end. Many people know that verse, but look at the next verse. It says in verse 12, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. I've had a number of people come to me before and says, Well, I've prayed, and I asked God for something. I asked for direction. I asked God to do this, do that. And if they just don't see something happen, you know, nearly instantly with relative, uh, you know, no effort. Well, then they say, well, God just didn't answer my prayer. But it says here that you shall seek for me and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And there's other scriptures that go along with this. The Lord isn't just going to reveal himself to you unless your whole heart is into it. You know, there's a lot of people that you might be watching my program right now and you're getting ready to go to work or to do something. And so you're listening and you're kind of thinking about this and you might have, you know, five minutes after this program is over before you have to get in the car and go to work and do things. And so you sit there and say, God, all right, you got five minutes. And if you want to change my life and make me a living sacrifice, and if I can just have a miraculous encounter with you in the next five minutes, fine. But then after that, I've got to go to work. I've got my favorite show that's coming on. I've got something else to do. Did you know people that have that kind of an attitude aren't going to really have an in-depth encounter with the Lord? For you to really experience God and have this life-transforming experience that I've been talking about, it, you have to believe and seek with all of your heart is what the scripture says. And the truth is most of us have not given our heart completely over to seeking the things of the Lord. Here's another way to say it, that as long as you can live without knowing God's will for your life, you will. But when you reach a place that I can't live this way, I'm not going to live this way, I know God has a purpose for my life and I will discover it. And when you get that intense and it may take a while for you to get to that place to where nothing else matters to you but God and His will for your life. But when you reach that place, when you are searching with all of your heart, that's when God reveals Himself to you. And in my own case, I told you about when I was in high school, I began to seek and pray and and study the Word five or six hours every night as a high school student. I did that for a year and a half. And then God spoke Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 to me. And for four months, I just focused on those scriptures. So if you add all that together, that's nearly two years of me just seeking God. And I got to a place to where this was not optional. I needed to know. I wanted to know. I was desperate to know God's will for my life. And when I got that way, boom, God shows up and God reveals himself to me. I believe one of the reasons that people watching this program, you may desire to know God's will. You might say, well, God, I, I sure hope what I'm doing pleases you and it glorifies you. You may not be opposed to doing God's will, but is that what you are seeking with your whole heart? Are you searching with your whole heart, which is what? Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, you have to seek and find when you shall search with your whole heart. You have to get to where you are just uh, totally dominated by something. You know, you could apply this to any area of your life. If you want to be healed, but you don't want to put any effort into being healed, renewing your mind, standing on the Word of God, 
doing this. As long as you can live without healing, well, then you will. But when you get to where I believe that by His stripes I'm healed and I refuse to give up and you stand, you'll see the healing manifest. Same thing is true of prosperity. When you get to where you can live on a lower plane and be less than what God wants you to be and you have accepted it and you are reconciled to it, you have you just committed yourself to this is where I am in life. You know what? That's where you'll stay. But when you are hungry for more, you will be fed. And so I'm applying all of these things to finding God's will for your life. You've got to get to a place to where you want to know God's will more than anything else. You aren't satisfied just doing your own thing, coming to the end of your life and hoping that it was good. You know, again, I think that some people who have great talents and abilities and maybe you're a great singer, maybe you're a great athlete, maybe you've got all kinds of natural talents and there's multiple things that you can do. In a sense, I feel sorry for you. And some people are probably thinking, why would you feel sorry for a person that's really talented and got all of these things? Because that means that you can do things in your own power that enable you to cope and to deal with life and maybe succeed and get through life just on your own without God. But you know what? I've never had any great talents or abilities. There's never been anything special about me. And one of the reasons that I was so determined to find God's will for me is because I've never been, you know, the best at anything. I've always been average, mediocre, and man, I didn't have a clue. There wasn't any natural talent or ability that I had that was going to propel me into anything that was going to make a significant difference. And because of it, I was desperate to find out what God's purpose for my life was. And so in a sense, I feel sorry for people that you can prosper and succeed and get by without God. I couldn't. And because of it, it drove me to God. It drove me to be dependent upon Him. And I really believe that that's a good thing. You know, right now we're doing things that I haven't got the expertise, the skill level, the knowledge of how to do things. You know, we just had a situation this week where we need, I forgot the exact amount, but it was around $2 million that I had to pay out on our building program. And... Um, we just didn't have it. I forgot we were 700 or maybe $800,000 short. And you know what? I had my management coming to me just as, I mean, just two days ago saying we hadn't got it. What are we going to do? And I said, hey, it's not the deadline yet. Yesterday was the deadline. This was two days ago. I said, I still got 24 hours to go. And I said, I'm not worried about it. And I just went on and did my things. Guess what happened? Yesterday, we got $900,000 came in in one gift and it paid for it and it worked. Did you know the point I'm making is I'm not smart enough to make this happen. I, I didn't do this. I didn't. It's just me following God. It's loving God. And because I am 100% dependent upon God and not upon me, it actually makes it easier. I don't feel any of the pressure because I can't do what I'm doing. It's way, way, way beyond me. And I'm telling you, that's a safe place to be. If you, let me say it this way, if, if what you are doing with your life is something that you can do in your own strength and in your own power, you're smart enough, you've got enough charisma, you've got enough money, you've got enough energy, you, got, you can do it on your own, then I doubt very seriously that you have found God's will for your life. Because God is a big God. God is going to call you to do something that's beyond yourself. He's going to put you in a situation that it takes more smarts, more money, more talent, more ability than what you have. If you're only doing what you can do in your natural self, I doubt very seriously that you have found God's will for your life. God is going to call everybody to do something bigger than themselves. Let me share a scripture with you that says that over here in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 1, in verse 26, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 
and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And look at verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. The reason God set it up this way is He gives you an assignment that's bigger than yourself. It's impossible for you to accomplish in yourself. And so He chooses people that aren't qualified. You know, if He just chose people who were perfect and in the natural had everything going for them, well, then people would give the credit for the success to that person. But when they see somebody like me, they see somebody who's weak, despised, base, nothing, that doesn't have any special abilities, and yet they see God doing things through me. You know, in just the last four years, we have spent $45 million extra dollars on building this campus in Woodland Park. That's above my $50 million a year that I need just to keep the television and radio ministry and everything else going. $45 million extra, we're paying cash. When people see something like that happen through a guy who used to be so poor that I couldn't pay attention, that I didn't have any money, I don't have the education, I don't, there, there is no way that people can look at me and say, look what Andrew has done. It is not me. God gets the glory. And he says that's why he does it, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I'm telling you what's happening in my life is way, way, way beyond me. It's God. It's God's power. I'm giving Him every bit of the glory. The only thing I've done is that I have made myself a living sacrifice. I have renewed my mind. I am following Him. I'm holding on for dear life. I'm, I'm fighting against unbelief and doubt and stuff. And because of it, it's just like I'm on a roller coaster and I'm strapped in and holding on for dear life, but I'm not controlling the thing. I'm going with God, and God's taking me on the ride of my life. I'm telling you, God has a plan for you, and it's bigger than what you think. It's better than what you think. Most people are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. I'm telling you, I would hate to come to the end of my life and look back and say, I played it too safe. God, I should have gone for it. I'd hate to stand before God and God tell me that, Andrew, here's what I had planned for your life and that I didn't even come close. I wasn't even moving in that direction. I was doing something else because it was just the safe thing to do. I'd hate that. I really believe that that's where the vast majority of Christians, probably the vast majority of people watching this program right now, you're doing what's safe. You're doing less than what's really in your heart. If somehow or another I could talk to you personally and if you had limitless amount of money and if your skill level and all of these things weren't a factor, if you could just remove all of the but ifs out of your life and, and if I could say, what is it that you really want to do? What is it that would just thrill you if this is what your whole life could be about? I bet you that 90% or more of the people watching this program right now would tell me something different than what you're doing. But you are letting circumstances, finances, uh, talents, abilities, or lack thereof limit you and stop you from pursuing what God has for you. I'm telling you, I think that that's terrible. Someday we're going to stand before the Lord and all of our excuses about, oh God, I didn't have the education. Oh God, I wasn't, uh, you know charismatic enough. Oh God, I didn't have enough money. I didn't. All of these excuses are going to be nothing when you stand before God and He says, here's my plan for your life. Here's what I wrote down before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, Psalms 139. Here's what I dictated for your life to be about. And here's what you did. I'm not sure that any of us will ever reach the completion of it because God is so big. I don't think that we in this physical body, in this limited physical body, could ever approach into everything that God has for us. But we ought to at least be moving in that direction. We ought to be heading in that direction. And if we shoot at the stars and miss and land on the moon, that's still more than most people have done. We ought to at least be moving in that direction. But I believe that the vast majority of people are going to stand before God. And when He reveals what His purpose, what His plan for your life was. 
I think that the vast majority of us are going to be weeping and wailing and crying. And that's the reason that God's going to have to wipe all tears away from our eyes because we're going to see the potential that we had. We're going to see what God really made us for and how far below His standard we lived. And it's going to cause a lot of grief. And it wouldn't be heaven if God didn't somehow or another just supernaturally wipe all tears away from our eyes. But praise God, I'm talking to you now and trying to get you to reevaluate and to seek God so that someday you won't stand before God completely having never attempted any of God's will for your life. If you're breathing, you still got time to discover God's will. God's got a purpose for your life. And these verses that I'm using, Romans 12, 1 and 2, are the key. You first of all become a living sacrifice. You commit yourself to God. You run up the white flag. Take all of the reservations off of the table. Just say, Father, there's nothing that I'm holding back. I've talked to some people before who says, God, I'll go, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything, but please don't send me to Africa. Please don't make me live in a grass hut and be a missionary or something. You know what? If you have any limitations and say, I'll do anything but this, I'll do anything but stand in front of people and speak. I'll do anything but go here or do this. As long as you have any limitations, you are not a living sacrifice. You know what? A sacrifice doesn't sit there and speak to the person who's sacrificing it and saying, I'll only go so far. If you're a sacrifice, you're a sacrifice. You don't have any control. You turn all control over to God. You know, I did this March the 23rd, 1968, and I'm going to be sharing a lot more about this. This is not everything I know about it, but it, it's not just a one-time deal. You have to start it. You have to make that commitment and head in that direction, but then you're going to have to be a living sacrifice. It's going to have to be acted out day after day, situation after situation. But you have to start somewhere. There's some of you that have never started. There's many things that you have limitations. God, I'll serve you as long as I can still have this standard of living, as long as I still get this. You're going to have to remove all of those qualifications and you're just going to have to run up a wet white flag and make an absolute unconditional surrender and say, God, I'm yours. Whatever you want to do with me. If, you're, if your career is standing in the way. Say, God, I'm willing to walk away from this career. I'm willing to walk away from money. I'm willing to walk away from fame. I'm willing to walk away from all of these quote-unquote huge potential. You're just willing to do whatever. And I can promise you, Jeremiah 29, 11, God's thoughts towards you are peace. They're good. It's to give you an expected end. God's not going to hurt you. He's going to help you. It might be different than what you think, but it will wind up being the perfect thing. What does it mean to be a partner? It means to know that you are helping the Word of God go farther and deeper than ever before. As the International Director of Andrew Womack Ministries, I get to go and see the results of, of the work of this ministry. Just recently in Kampala, in a place called Kasubi, it's a, it's a slum area where there are a lot of people, a lot of poverty, a lot of disease. And as I was there, a, a truck rolled in and on the back of the truck was a 40-foot container with over half a million dollars of medical equipment, vital, life-saving medical equipment. And that was really through the efforts of our partners. And that's going to completely fit out and refurbish two medical centers in two parts of Kampala. That will affect hundreds of thousands of lives. And it's our partners that did that. I have with me Bishop Herbert, who's been the inspiration for most of this. First of all, to Andrew Womack Ministry, thank you so much, thank you a thousand times. I don't know how to express my, my gratitude. And I also want to thank the partners of Andrew Womack Ministry who have made this dream possible. I know that this thing here, it's a lifeline for the people in this, in this area. It's going to be a source of life. God bless you, bless you big time, thank you. I see the difference, the tangible difference on the ground. Thank you so much for sowing into this ministry. It would be impossible to do this without your help. And thank you because together we are making a difference.